So, uh, this is not a stream about setting up OBS. <laughs> it's not intended to be. The intent is to uh, see if we can do some more glowing telegram again. Maybe I can update the stream title to say that as well. Imagine that. Maybe working <laughs> on a glowing telegram. Telegram. Telegraph? No. Mm -hmm. Save. Ooh, from stream info, you can control things. I guess this will be some thinking time. Uh, I had three pull requests that I was working through. Why well, I had two? Looks like Dependabot opened one. Um, I don't even have Docker running locally. <laughs> there we go. Uh, don't even have Docker running locally on this machine, I think. So this should be fun. I may just like do some coding stuff and not, um, but not actually like try to run anything or test anything. Just go, just go with it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, let's see, I have this PR, this draft pull request for some input validation rules. Uh, I think that was, I was playing around with some ideas of, oh, hey, could we, I guess ultimately, hold on, what was actually in this PR before I go off on a tangent? Okay, so I think right now all I'm doing is importing some, I'm, I'm defining my own validators that extend or are based off of the React admin validators. And then I start to use those. So I think the only reason this is a draft is because I wasn't sure if I wanted to go down this path. Like specifically have like specific, here's how you validate a audio track count or a content type or a file name or a file, and like have like a dozen plus different validators that can be imported, that could be used on fields. I guess I don't have anything against this, really. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about when I left this as a draft was, did I want to do more? And I think that's why I'll leave it as a draft for now. I want to think a little bit more about, do I... Hold on. Man, let me do that in OBS. Sorry, you're going to see a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff today. because one monitor. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I'll leave this as, leave this as a draft until I think a little bit more about how I want to move forward with this. I want to think about what it would look like if I were to go and start um, doing more, adding more validators in the different forms and whether I want to really do it like that or if I want to do something else. Because I think another option is to have validation at the whole form level 
And that's still even with the React Admin uh, UI setup, it will still let you give per field feedback on validation. So if we were to use something like Zod, you could integrate that, right? You could have um, some validation. Like what I'd really like to see is something where we can have one single definition of the shapes of some of the data, because a lot of the things that, that we're passing both, but back and forth and showing in the UI are things that are common data elements. So I would want a single, I would ideally like a single place where all of the details about validation are defined and then generate, you know, maybe that's what I should be thinking. Well, there's difficulties. Like if we were, if, if I were to set this up so that like it generated the rust structs for the back end, that could be interesting, but that generator would need a way to generate that code in a designated place. Maybe I could just have a, uh, a local crate for that would be generated like that, but maybe not. Well, the issue then is that I can't easily implement things. Like I probably want the generation to, um, the code gen to generate the, the Rust output in line in a file within the module so that we can extend it, like we can implement things on the, on the structs. And I also probably would want it to like be able to say, oh, um, you know, add these, um, like, make it serializable and deserializable and, and all that stuff. Uh, as in, like if we're thinking about a struct like is defined inside of stream structs here, you know, we have these create request, a uh, stream request that derives debug and deserialize. And then we have other ones like stream detail view that derive debug and serialize. Um, and then on the, the client side, then we need types that are compatible with this. And then the thing that we're not doing here, and mostly not doing in the front end, is defining like more specific validation. Okay, thumbnail is a string, but actually it should be a URL. Um, stream ID uh, should look like a UUID. Those sorts of things could be things that we do. Um, not to mention validation that's like cross field. I don't know if I have examples of those here. Like something you could think about doing is saying it's probably an error to have has episodes be true, but not, well, maybe. There are things where you could say uh, there validation cross field uh, dependencies anyway so I want to think about that more <laughs> um, net, like just thinking about it just now I, I've already sort of changed my my thinking about the idea of maybe what I should be doing is have maybe something like prior to today what I was thinking is it would be nice to um, be able to code gen the TypeScript interface from this or from the Axum, like figuring out what the types are that are being returned by the API endpoints defined in Axum. So like inside of, uh, well, between the handler definition here and then where we're referencing it in, um, you know, we really should like, Maybe I should move the definition of these routes somewhere else. Anyway, um, and this this detail here, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know yet, but right. So my, my point though was that maybe it might be, make more sense to do the thing that generally I've disliked before, which might be like we could use an open API spec and then code gen both the back end and front end data type shapes. I don't know. 
Does OpenAPI have kind of more, because you can define, like I said, tangents. But hey, whatever. Let's send it. Do whatever. Do I even have a way to see chat? There we go. Cool. So. Schema, path, external, parameter, request body, responses, response, callback, example, link, header, tag, schema. Um, what is the thing I'm thinking of? Someone, someone, <laughs> there's a mind reader out there. Tell me what I'm trying to think of. Uh, responses object. Response object, description headers, content, media type range. Right. So we reference. Schema content, media type object. Schema schema object. It's a superset of JSON schema specification draft. A discriminator is an object name that is used to differentiate between other schemas, which may also satisfy the payload description. Nice. Uh, so what I was thinking about is, is there a way, I guess open API he here, Like somewhere in this, or the thing this is, that it's pulling in with uh, JSON schema, is there a way to express any kind of um, validation of contents and fields? I guess the, the challenge there would be, even if you did that, then translating that into I mean, what am I saying? I know there's code gen. I guess the question is, how good is the code gen for 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 things? Hmm. Wait, 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 wait. Isn't there? Um, hold on. Open API Zod. Zod's Open API Converter. How about the other way around? Yes. Well, I do have control over the backend, but I've chosen to do all the backend in Rust on this project. Okay, so that, that might take some further research. Figure out what I might want to be able to do there. Um, but I can imagine like having three code gen paths, like steps. They could be in parallel, right? But one that goes from open API to our Rust backend structs that define input and output types. And then um, another, and, and in that in that case, the implementate like the impulse here would probably be in a in a second file inside the same crate. I'm pretty sure that we can do that. Like this doesn't, these, these implementations do not have to be in the same file. They just need to be in the same crate. Um, yeah, for stream simple view. 
Uh, and then, so then the second path would be cogening the um, TypeScript types for the front end, which would be very helpful for like in, well, in the front end, clearly. Wherever that file is, data provider. There we go. We well, my laptop has not caught on fire yet. <laughs> uh, although, is pretzel okay? Okay, we're, we're just switching tracks. Um, but yeah, so I have like these ad hoc interfaces, right? And I'm just duplicating the same information essentially, maybe. Um, or I have places where I have some interfaces, but they are like I'm doing some transfer, like I'm renaming keys or something. Um, and this could be a lot more explicit if I had like, here are all the types from the API, all the APIs. Uh, stitched together in one place and that would be like that API layer interface definition um, yeah I'm not running beam install and forever in this so I'm gonna get errors uh, so that would be the second path and then the third path would be if I could figure out some way to have more uh, detailed validation of, of values that could be is there something like Zod for Rust Oh, I hit a key. Oh, right. I'm leaning over to the, the laptop keyboard and instead of using my, my $400 Moonlander keyboard that's right in front of me, uh, made a crate for bridging types between Rust and Zod. Make it easier, make it, make it possible to declare types, go away. Log in. Uh, and Rust is a definitive source of truth between the back end and front end. Type reflect. Seven months ago. Interesting, interesting. Previously I was using TS Rust to bridge types from Rust to TypeScript. There was a couple things I didn't like about it. TS Rust creates vanilla TypeScript types rather than schema declarations doesn't exist at runtime, right? So that that that's the, when I was talking about that third path, that's like trying to do um, runtime validation of values, not just compile time, like static type checking. Uh, actually I have reliable type checking in TypeScript, you need to, <laughs> that, that, that is a loaded phrase that I think on its face is not true, like is, is misleading. Uh, use a runtime uh, schema framework like Zod to verify data coming as yes. TS Rust uses tests to generate the types. Hmm. Type reflect gives you a derived macro to make a type exportable. An export macro to export exportable types. Okay, so this is more along the lines of what I was originally thinking. Um, rather than what I was talking about earlier where I would have like a outside of code like specification of the APIs and then I would export from that I would code gen in both directions so this is more what I was thinking before today where rust would be the source of truth I think is what this is going for the issue <laughs> the the issue with the other things that I've been looking at in the same vein were they are were well not focused on Zod or TypeScript specifically they were more of getting the open a API spec from Rust and doing it at runtime like for you know you have a Swagger UI that you want to point to a spec 
and that's not what I want at all. I want something that's a build time thing that I can gen to then code gen updated types for the front end. Uh, and maybe this is it. Let's take a look. This was updated three months ago, really 0.4.0. .0. So type reflect provides procedural macros to allow for runtime reflection on Rust types. Its main goal is to facilitate sharing serializable types between languages, for example, in the use case of sharing types between a Rust web service consumed by a TypeScript client. Some utilities outside, uh, out of the box for exporting uh, Rust types to TypeScript has both raw TS types and Zod schemas and is designed to be extensible. If you have the Zod schemas, like if you're interested in the Zod schemas, then you can get the, you can get the, like a type from the schema uh, with Zod. TS Quote provides procedural macros and utilities for generating TypeScript code in Rust. Okay, so this is like, sounds like this is like a utility thing that's used by this. Example usage. So we uh, derive reflect on a struct, and then we are using export types, and we we tell it details about where to export Zod and TypeScript. I wonder if that can be a relative path. Invoking this macro would generate the following ts export.ts file. Okay, so I'm talking about that, and Zod export.ts talking about this. Okay, type reflect cratering me. It's fairly rough around the edges. It's already usable in its current state, but for many instances, uh, but for instance, the Rust docs uh, are a work in progress. You may also expect to run into bugs and limitations. Oh, that's interesting though. It's interesting. Um, I think the downside of this versus generating, like going from OpenAPI might be, you might be able to give more detail in the OpenAPI spec than you would be able to just with the struct in Rust. I guess the question is how, how rich of uh, like, how much detail can you put into uh, an open API spec. I, I gotta admit, I it's been a little while since I've written one of these by hand. There are spe uh, specification extensions as well. So there are things like format, apparently. as defined by the JSON schema validation vocabulary. Interesting. Data types can have an optional modifier property format. Okay. Define format, state times, and durations. According to the duration production. ISO 8601 a, uh, a, B, and F is given in Appendix A of RFC 3339. It's based on the 1988 version of ISO 8601, that there have been revisions even since 2000 as well. It does not. Um, informational only may contain errors. So, Interesting. Dates, times, email address, email, ID, and email. Host names, IP. So we, oh, UUID. 
URI template, JSON pointers, regex, um, and the possibility for extension. So at least there's a place to put that kind of detailed information about validation. So let me let me do this. I think how does that how does that impact this? Uh, probably not. Well, I guess if I do pursue that path of having kind of a uniform generated validation and I use odd and stuff, then I might actually just get rid of this and do form level validation so I can pass the whole form. The issue with that then is that, huh, I, it needs further thought because there's probably things like the idea here where I'm using the validator like in title input. Um, oh, I see. I'm doing it at the the stream edit. I'm saying this form should be you should revalidate on blur. That should still be the whole form, right? So like a form level validator, that then pass back feedback on specific fields would still work. So I might just trash this PR and replace it with something where we're using Zod. Um, do I have something in the project? Do I have something in the project about this? Um, maybe I mentioned Zod. Maybe I mentioned um, type. Okay. Yes, this was the one when I started thinking about this last week. So, um, generate structs, interfaces, validation from a single source of truth. human consumption really, I guess. But also generate uh, rust structs. There you go. And TypeScript. Types. Zod, um, what are they called? <laughs> Schemas or Zod thingies? Thingies. All right, why no music? Why no, okay. a lot of reading and talking but that's <laughs> most development I guess uh, okay so dependent bot is trying to update uh, Vite and something else I'll just try to do this by hand. Yeah, so there was um, an 
the EJS CVE, I think at some point. We got 15 things in the security tab. <laughs> So this was, uh, some confusion. That's why I turned the, um, turned on the, the batch dependent bot settings, uh, because it opened like a ton of PRs and they were all kind of broken because they were going to update individual crates in the, in the repo and it probably would have broken things. Uh, so anyway, so let's let's actually get into VS Code and do something, and not save that. Okay. So why why do we have create beat as a dependency? I mean, I know why it was installed to set up the project, but do we really need that? Is that listed here? No. No. Oh, I see. So create v is inside of the, the v package, and this is just pulling in a bunch of stuff about the sub packages in v that were released. I see. So what what changed from 4.5.3 to 5.0? Oh, Take a look at the migration guide. Migrating from V4. Okay. Uh, let's see, what version of Node am I running locally? <laughs> 18. Check. Oh, hey, Brainless. How's it going? Sorry, I just saw your chat now. I'm uh, kind of limited in my ability to see things. Currently using my phone to see chat. I'm on my little laptop. How's your Sunday morning going? Or whatever time it is for you, no worries. I thought you might not, may not see it. Uh, I just happened to glance over. Um, roll up four. Eat is now using roll up four. Import assertions have been renamed. We're not using that. Not using that. Not using that. If you're using TypeScript, make sure to set module resolution to bundler or node 16 node next. Okay, so let's check tsconfig. Uh, skip lib check true apparently is what I'm doing. I also have module resolution of node. Maybe it should be node next. But we're setting skip lib, lib check to true apparently, so I guess that's fine. Uh, deprecate CJS node API. Uh, we're not. I don't think we're using require Vite anywhere. Vite config JS. Export defaults. 
Pet Module. Okay, back to Pet Fixture Sun. The closest package that JSON file has type module or use the MJS MTS extension. Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting. Well, which one of those am I going to do? <laughs> I'm just waking up. We'll be uh, going to have breakfast now. All right. Well, enjoy your breakfast. In a basic beat project. I guess this is probably still a basic beat project. What happens if I say type module how broken is this <laughs> CD front ends there may be some background noise um, my hotel room is in the, the corner of the hotel um, I mean it, it's a it's a Sunday morning it's not that busy but hmm. located downtown today. Very big in particular. Node 18.18 or 18.7. Should be fine. It's gonna take a minute. What else we got? Let's let's just assume that type module is gonna fix make everything work. Rework define and import meta env replacement strategy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we're not really using all of this too much, I think. So now it's using ES build to handle replacements and builds. SSR externalized modules value now matches production. Exports the CSS files, use the question mark inline query instead. Are we I mean we have a CSS file, right? Or do we not? Because we're using material you know, for everything. We we dropped all the CSS files this used to have. Uh huh. So things I'm not using. Okay. None of 
that should apply to me. Okay, so should be able to upgrade. First we have to install the current versions of things. It's related to story storybook, but I just don't remember seeing that as a as a separate thing like that. specifically to support using chromatic uh, which I have used I was using this with um, the other project that I was streaming before um, daily jewel um, and maybe at some point I might use this I guess the uh, storybook setup stuff that you run these days to like initialize storybook for a project just automatically includes it. I guess there's no no harm in that. Maybe while I'm waiting for this. Used to be a link here for like um, want to see older releases. I'm just trying to think of the first version <laughs> of a node that I had used as well before this. For a second, and then it disappeared. The schedule. So v dot uh, v zero dot ten dot x. K 
came out in 2013. What was the version before this? Yeah, we're still <laughs> still trying to install. IO.js, yes. Uh, archive. Was that the end of 2011? That I'm thinking of? Let's say beginning of 2012. So Node was on 067. Zero dot five. It's moved on from material UI stuff to date funds. I guess now we're <laughs> stuck. I'm not gonna interrupt it, so I'll just wait. All right, and the other thing we're trying to update is uh, EGS, right? Release notes, commits. We're trying to upgrade to the next patch version. No, no notes. What, uh, what changed? Ah, uh, yes. piece of code that is designed for the purpose of executing arbitrary code um, is not in itself in and of itself a security vulnerability
so they switched from using the Mocha Runner. They have a utility function. They use that. Oh, I see. So it. They, they run a thing that then runs the same test runner. Okay. And an example. Some notes about security. Are we there yet? Was the um, did this come from a PR? <laughs> Where did this come from? I'm kind of curious about the discussion. merged two, two years ago. Oh, right, right, right. The, the update recently was an update. Where, where was that updated? Last month. Last year. Interesting. Can we sort by merge date? Recently updated. Melee? What's it mean? <laughs> what? Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> why, is, why is there a zip file? finished so we can finish our node install Launch a new PowerShell terminal. Okay, so now node should be twenty. Yep. doing things. Um, so I want to update EJS. Uh, so that's a dependency. <laughs> I have a dependency. Um, actually, probably the easiest thing to do. Well, there's a couple things. I could do like npm ls EJS. I could um, like do npm 
update or upgrade? One of the one of the two. You can also look at this PR and see what changed. So somewhere in the package lock. EJS was updated. And some other things. EJS. Is that a dependency of Vite? Oh, that might sort itself out then. If I just upgrade Vite to uh, 5. Is there a new version of Vtest? Am I allowed to know? 1.6. Let's try just doing that. All right. package JSON. Whoops. I just noticed this at undefined here. Uh, right, so we have other dependencies that also probably need to be updated. Now, a question is, is this going to break our stuff with storybook? We just deport this here. Yeah. That's right. I hit control C. We got a lot of factors making things slow today. We got the hotel Wi-Fi. We got me trying to stream over said hotel Wi-Fi. We got me uh, 4.21.1, published five months ago. Okay. Is that, is that compatible with, uh, When was Vite 5 uh, released? Hold on, let's just... I feel like maybe just going to NPM is going to be faster than waiting for VS Code to do it. <laughs> At least I'll be able to read the docs there. And of course I'm downloading music, streaming music too. Trying to. There it goes. Hmm. Thank you. 
this. It's just odd, right? When you have, uh, there's a, obviously there's more than one way <laughs> to think about things, but like Vite is on version five, but the plugin they would use to use Vite with React is on version four. What version of Vite is this compatible with? Is that even a consideration? How would I know that without just trying it? computer this would be faster and it would be you know I'd be running through things very quickly trying different versions of stuff um, but yeah it's 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 nicer okay so that seemed to work was um NPM audit fix one want to fix for us maybe that's that EGS thing Storybook, Storybook, Storybook CLI, Core Server, Builder Manager, had that EGS dependency. Um, is um, let's do this. NPM test. We have a couple of unit tests in this project. Not a lot. Not as many as I would maybe like. <laughs> But uh, 49, mostly around the uh, OTIO exporter, since that was pretty pretty finicky. Okay, and then what else do I want to do? I can just do like npm run dev, right? It's not gonna. I mean, it's gonna start, but it's going to uh, not have a backend to talk to, among other things. why I wanted to test this see if uh, there was some issue with the upgrade so like there there aren't any XHR requests All right so this is not it waiting for something from the, the back end we wouldn't be in this view if we were H enter to show help. Um, restart the server. Did it though? Oh, it's thinking. <laughs> Okay, definitely 
finally thinking. Did this finish? Uh, cool. It did. Let's just try that again. some progress this time. Be connected. Okay, that's a good sign. It's pulling things in. Why so slow? Is it me? have a good before right so is this is this slow because this computer is slow <laughs> or is this slow because of some changes with, with Vite? well maybe let's see if this actually does load at all look, it looks like it's loading stuff now Oof. okay that that's normal yeah there's no back end, so that's normal. And it took a uh, minute and a half to load. Okay, what I think I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna quit out of this. There we go. We're gonna create a new branch to um, update uh, dependencies. Save. Okay, there we go. Update beat. It's gonna be the first thing. I'm gonna save that out. Commit that, that is to say. Uh, and then I'm gonna see if I can just do a general like update everything pass. Let's see, how do we do that? NPM help. <laughs> Is it uh, update? Great. 
update all the packages listed in the latest version. Expecting similar constraints to build your package and its dependencies. Also Im install missing packages. All packages in specified location will be updated. It won't update the similar version values of direct dependencies. I see. So this is what I want. npm update dash dash save. So if I have like a carrot dependency, it will look for minor version updates and then it will update the listed version there. Tilde dependencies, only patch updates. Okay, I'll start with this. Like, is there a new major version of Prettier? of ESLint config prettier. Is there, what if I wanted to say, hypothetically, and maybe you would you should never do this, but maybe I wanted to. Um, what if I just wanted to install whatever the latest version of a package was? latest. Yep. So for instance, if I were to go over to I just wanted to say I always just want the latest version of Prettier. With some caveats. <laughs> mm. Right, the caveats being that, oh, they have a beta version, I probably don't want to install that. Why is it, okay, let's say. Versions. Okay, yeah, and and this is typically typically what you'll see on a on well maintained npm uh, projects. There's a latest, and there might be a next or a beta or other tags. So maybe what I want to do in my package JSON for prettier is just say latest. like for build stuff specifically. Now there's some risk there, right? If uh, there's a new version of Prettier, like Prettier 4 comes out and that gets released, but the ESLint config Prettier stuff isn't updated, maybe it's subtly broken or not so subtly broken. Um, Probably less of a concern with like ESLint stuff because you can see, oh, that's not right, and then you'll dig into it and figure out why. It'd be worse for things like React and Storybook and more runtime things. 
but I don't know that I would necessarily want to say latest for those things. I probably only would want to say latest for um, actual dev. These are all listed as dev dependencies. To some extent, like everything here could be a dev dependency. Is that true? Um, yeah, yeah. And on, on a project where you are shipping a bundled like output, like everything you need to like upload is in a bundle, like for a front end app like this. Pretty much everything should probably just be in dev dependencies because you're not gonna really gonna well, it doesn't really matter, I guess is the thing, because you're not distributing a an NPM module. You're building a bundle. In a, in a dev environments of some kind. Like there's, these are independencies and everything else is in dev dependencies, but um, there's no need for <laughs> these to be split like this. Yeah, I probably would not want to put like um, Vite or Vtest as latest either, or TypeScript or any of these things. Too, I feel like the, the interaction between like definitely not TypeScript, but like Vite and Storybook and, uh, and React and those things are more likely to uh, cause problems if um, you're not careful about which versions of things you're using. So we're gonna see what we get with just doing npm update. I'm gonna go back for prettier and ESLint stuff and set it to latest. Sunday morning. This is honestly probably the right kind of thing to be doing for Glowing Telegram today, just because this computer and my internet is so slow. I'm just hanging out here. Remember to look at chat to see if anyone says anything. Ah, uh, and sip some coffee. No, it's almost gone. <laughs> request open for glowing telegram currently which is the project from like a month ago or so the the chatbot written in elixir i i'm gonna come back to this really <laughs> made a lot of progress on this actually uh back two months ago <laughs> Actually, um, yeah, we got a Dockerized Elixir um, application that uh, can interact with Switch Chat, see messages, send messages, do other things, and uh, there's a lot of stuff to do on it. It's just not been um, kind of the number one thing to do. But now that I've gotten to the point where the actual like workflow, aka, I mean, moving towards having this thing that's loading here, <laughs> Come on now. Yeah. 
internet is slow. Um, this workflow, hey Brainless. Taking notes. <laughs> But, uh, but now that this, you know, this stuff is not done, but it's at the point where I'm actually putting episodes on YouTube again, using uh, Glowing Telegram. It's, it's now at the point where, um, I don't know, do I want to focus more on getting it more streamlined and better? Do I want to add capabilities? I'm not sure. Priorities are a little bit more ambiguous. So sleeping. Ended up playing Mind Over Magic until almost 8 a.m. Wow. <sighs> yeah, sadly, um, I don't know how much gameplay I'm going to be able to get to this week. I'll be away at a company thing for the week and uh, and then planes to and fro as well and uh, I just have my laptop well I have my work laptop and then I have my my personal laptop which is what I'm streaming from and uh, unfortunately the thing that I really wanted to be able to do which is to load up Great Tech New Horizons um, seems to not want to work on this, this machine. I even updated my drivers, my NVIDIA drivers, which I apparently had not updated in like two years. Still doesn't work, so I, I don't know. Uh, is this done? Okay. We, we removed 104 packages, added 101 packages, changed 228 packages, audited 1,151 packages in nine minutes. Yeah, so... Um, and and to be honest, um, I definitely wouldn't be even if I could get GTNH or something else to play on this laptop. Um, I would not be able to necessarily uh, stream it. Like it's hard enough just streaming this, let alone something that would actually like use graphic. Uh, like GPU and stuff and CPU um, I I do want to stream though I probably am not going to be able to stream at all tomorrow night because uh, I will be in transit and I don't know how I'm gonna feel on Friday I'll be, I'll, I'll be in transit then as well. Let's say, let's put it that way, and uh, may not be able to do that. And then Wednesday, um, it's going to depend on what happens. But if I do stream at all this week, it's probably going to be like from my phone. I might do like a Duolingo stream or just like a just chatting thing for a little bit. rather than, you know, something more extended. All right, so what what have we done here? We updated some minor versions of things. Uh, it's probably fine. What could, pos what could possibly go wrong? It could just not work. <laughs> um, like, hmm. Types node probably can change now. So let's do this. Um, update. Oh, you know what I could do? Let's make the commit message the, the command I ran. Brilliant. All right, so the things I wanted to do, I wanted to say for prettier, this is gonna just be latest. And also for all the ESLint stuff. It 
Is this going to break at some point? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I'll deal with that when that happens. Um, and then the other thing I saw is so types node. Do the version numbers of the types match like node versions? Probably not. Maybe it should be 20 though. We, I, I am running node 20. Let's update it. Okay. If I npm install, or before I do this, maybe I should do uh, npm test. <laughs> npm run dev and see if it actually loads with the things I just did. Cool. Uh, and then Should just do a hard refresh. Actually, yeah, yeah, hold on. Let's just do this. Now, previously, this took like a minute and a half to load. Clear everything and then load page. There we go. Now we have a a number. But uh, yeah. So anyway, I could always go back to playing some more Mind Over Magic. We could continue from last time or start a new thing. My, my sense is we did not get that far into the game. Uh, when we were playing last. Yeah, and, and normal situation here because there is no back end. <laughs> What's that? Uh, Someone just has to suggest that as the game for Friday. And and that could come back. That's how that works. <laughs> um, okay, so... Wait. NPM install again. How many times in my life have I run npm install? Quite, quite a number. <laughs> I keep forgetting it's Friday on Friday, so I keep. <laughs> um. Something I was thinking about doing, kind of, sort of in that in that vein, uh, is let's get a fresh tab here. Is um, when I return to my desktop computer, maybe actually having the stream go live and have. Like go live at like an hour in advance. Maybe, especially for like the Friday stream, I could do something where we do like words on stream or one of those other like viewer interaction things where like I'm not even, you know, I'm, you know, uh, 
probably finishing a shower, or whatever I'm doing, right, before the stream starts. Uh, before, you know, I start playing whatever I'm playing, um, have like, instead of using a Twitch poll, maybe we could, because I still want to use channel points, maybe I could have like channel point redemption things that tie into a poll that's kind of external so that it can run for longer than 15 minutes. I don't know. I don't know exactly how that would work. I'm just kind of... It's something I was thinking about the other day. Uh, okay, well, it, it opens. That's pretty much all I can test without there being a back end. Uh, so... And... Um, All right, I don't have... All right, I probably need to reload a bunch of extensions, don't I? Didn't I have Copilot installed on this one uh, as well? I didn't, wow. For Rust Analyzer. It's like I'm missing my little uh, sparkle here <laughs> to be able to auto-generate a message. Uh, let's see. There was something else that I saw recently that actually I would be hard to do in this circumstance because like the, the, the change is split into also the package lock. Yeah, I need to go and sign in later. I'll do that. Uh, what was it, though? Nah, never mind. This is not a good place to have that as an example. Um, Rust Analyzer and Cargo Plugins. Yeah. It's deprecated. Use Rust Analyzer instead. Very clever uh, description there, Copilot. Um, use latest for yes, length and prettier. Ideally, I suppose I could have just updated these and then run npm install and then committed those changes and then did the type one, uh, the node one. It's all gonna get squashed anyway, so whatever. <laughs> all right, let's push that up. Spent an hour and a half reviewing pull requests and updating dependencies. That's that's about right. That's very realistic. auto merge it once the build succeeds which hopefully it will that works on my machine is there anything we could work on today like make progress on without having like a functional environment to run anything um
I see that PR and think, wait, there are two required approvals? <laughs> uh, where? This one? There's three. Checks. No required approvals. <laughs> no reviews are required. Because you can't you can't approve your own pull request. Right? If if I did require approvers, then I wouldn't be able to merge anything. <laughs> because you can't you can't uh, pull request authors can't approve their own pull requests, so yeah, you do two approvals as a requirement for merging. Yeah, that, um, I don't think that's uncommon. And it's gone. When I worked in a startup where it was, sometimes it was just me and another uh, another dev, basically. More complicated than that, but sometimes it was down to just the two of us, right? Um, we would just review each other's things, right? So there could only be one approver. And then I've, you know, a lot of years I uh, <laughs> was in a situation like this where I'm the only one working on a project. But unlike this, it's for you know it's for a client um, and I've shipped a lot of bugs over the years so Add ability to link series records, YouTube playlist, add uploaded apps to the right playlist. I could I could start working on that. I can't really Maybe we could do some unit tests for that. For bits of that. Uh, if I wanted to. Um so we would need to have something. Right, I think I have some links to some resources in this item. Nope, <laughs> let's convert to issue. There we go. Uh, I did not. I did not include any links to the uh, to the API docs. Okay, so uh, YouTube. Data API. Hey, I've searched for this before. Playlist items insert. This method has one common use case. Brainless says, yesterday I was doing some off the books work, but my mind was killing me seeing we had the same code duplicated in five files and I was missing a case in each one. So refactoring time. Well, code duplication is not always wrong or bad. Depending on if the lifetime or the life cycle, how do, how do you say that, right? So like you build a service and the service is tied to, let's let's really simplify things. Say we're talking about a company. The company has like five different departments. It has like a marketing department, it has a HR department, it has this or that or whatever. And these different departments, let's say they all have software engineers and they're like coding their own things, which is maybe a thing that sometimes happens and sometimes it's not wanted. But anyway, just, just a, a toy example here, right? Um, but like one department needs this code for a project um, and it's like for a limited thing, um, but it's, right, okay. I think I know what I'm trying to say here, right? So how do the requirements change over time and who changes the requirements? 
Yeah, trust me, this was wrong on many levels. As those files keep growing in quantity as they are per operation and line, a line of business. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, and in a lot of cases, yeah, duplicating the same code over and over again is a smell. But the other side of that is sometimes you just need to do that duplication because maybe there is some underlying Uber service that can be like the thing that the whole company uses and it's configurable, but that comes at a cost, right? Versus um, like, especially as requirements from different stakeholders change over time, then you're in a, you end up in a circumstance where why does it take so long? Well, we build it, we built this thing to support all these different use cases that we knew of. And, you know, one department wants to change it one way and wants to change it another. And given our current architecture, those changes are incompatible, right? So that it is a hypothetical, but I've, I've seen things like that happen, right? Where you try to make a thing that solves <laughs> all the problems. And uh, in the short term, that can be good because you understand what the use cases are. But in the long term, you end up having one thing that's way more complicated than having 20 things would have been. Now that may not apply to you. That may not apply in, in, in most cases, but just just the thing <laughs> that I try to keep in mind. And uh, I suppose try to tell others uh, when they're talking about how we need to refactor everything. Uh, but we're not refactoring here, we're making a new thing. We are making a request, maybe to playlist items insert. This example adds a video to the specified playlist. Okay, so there's a playlist items endpoint. There's some authorization that hopefully we have. I did notice recently with the uh, capability in Glowing Telegram to upload to YouTube that I'm not sure exactly why, like some of the videos didn't successfully upload and some of them failed. And I might need to add more logging because some of that was broken and I need to figure out why. So I can rely on doing more stuff like this where I'm automating, adding the video into the playlist in the right place. Do we have an actual example that I can see that does the thing? What if I click try it? Request parameters part on behalf of content owner, request body. Is it snippet? Yeah. Okay, so like a video ID and a playlist ID. So this is what I would be building. What is be on behalf of content owner? It's optional. It's exclusively for a YouTube content partner. So pretty sure I'm not that. <laughs> Required parameters part. The part parameters serve two purposes in this operation. It identifies the properties that the right operation will set as well as the properties that the API response will include. So I think we wanna just set it to snippet and the request what body would be snippet. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me go back to main. Which now, should now have some updates. Once I can click the button, there we go. And then we're gonna start working on our new issue.
At some point, I might like create milestones and stuff. Okay, so to do this, we need to do a couple things. Uh, oh, right, right, right. So th this is what I wanted to look close closely at: the playlist ID, right? So we need to store the playlist ID somewhere in the database, and then. Yeah, let's let's think about this. So um, number seventy-six. series table let's make a list right so plan for number 76 okay so a thing that we already have on the episode record is like an index number which is really intended to organize episodes so that you can filter by series and then look at all the episodes in a, like an ascending order. So that will kind of tie in with how this is gonna work with the playlist, I think. Although, how does this work with kind? What is kind? And is there a way, oh, there is a position as well on snippet. is uh, the value will be to playlist item okay is that is that optional do I need to provide that I guess not if it was not in the, the list or in the request body step it um, and then how does position work Unsigned integer, the order in which items appear in the playlist, the value is a zero based index. So the first item has position zero. Okay. So this is gonna match up with how I'm expecting that the UI in Chloe Telegram will represent the episode index. Yes. Cool. Um, so, If we have the playlist ID, how is this gonna work? Hmm. Because we also need to know the, the ID of the video, and currently that's not something we're, we're even saving. We're not getting that back. We're not doing anything with it. But that kind of ties into something else that I wanted to resolve, which is, well, without a working app, I can't really demonstrate it, but um, well, I can at least run the front end, I guess. We're just gonna get an error, but we'll at least be able to see the UI to talk through it. it loads so today like when I'm going to the episode list 
and I'm selecting the episodes I want to upload to YouTube. Um, I select the ones I want to upload, and then there's a a um, I'm just gonna the view. It's not gonna. There you go. Select the things, and when you select them, then you get a bulk action to like upload to YouTube, um, and that like triggers an asynchronous job that goes and um, does the upload, and you know informs me back through the the tasking apparatus that's visible up here. It's not gonna load because there's no backend right now. Um, that shows like the status of all the tasks and whether it's completed or not. But a thing that um, I would like is that on the episode records, there's a Boolean flag currently that says is published. And right now I have to go and manually set that because I want to be able to see like, okay, I have all these episode records. Some of these are like, things from when I was testing things, they're things that I'm working on getting onto YouTube, they are, you know, whatever they are. Um, maybe I want to toggle that Boolean when the video is uploaded to YouTube. Or maybe I want to change the semantics of this around a little bit. Um, if I'm going to have something that's going to update the record when the task completes, maybe I want it to put the ID of the video from YouTube in the record. And then maybe I'll use is published to track when the video actually is live uh, and viewable. Maybe, maybe. Um, but either way, there's a, a piece of data flow that's missing right now, right? So uh, an example of this a different way, kind of how I'm working around what you might consider a limitation here of, of how things are set up is when I go into a stream record and I trigger audio transcription, go into the stream, go into the specific record, go to the tab for audio transcription and click the button, then the uh, a task runs, right? And then I can click a button to check to see if the task run. And then once it says it's completed, I can click a button to retrieve the results. And so the, the asynchronous job is storing the results in Redis. And there is no mechanism on the back end to get the data from Redis back into the application, uh, like the, the record of the stream itself. The only way of doing that is in the UI. Like we're loading the data from the backend from the, the transcription API, from the, well, really from the, the task API um, into the front end. And then once you've kind of reviewed things as much as you want, you can save it and that saves it to Postgres. Um, so we're, we have this like, the front end is doing the data transfer from one backend service to another. And that makes sense in a lot of cases because you wanna just don't like do a manual review of data. On the other hand, it, it's a little weird because you are, this might be something otherwise you, you would just want the data to go from Redis to Postgres or maybe through you know some kind of service or something. Uh, that instead you're having going through the front end. Uh, and especially in the case of something where we're getting just an ID or some, some data that does not need to be reviewed. It is what it is. We don't need to have the user review it. And we don't want to wait for the user to click through things and save them for that data to be available. I just want it to be immediately available. But how do we do that? When the whole idea with the task API is that services can call the task API um, to queue up a job. And then the task API really only ever, ever interacts with those services. It doesn't interact with um, the CRUD API service that you know writes things to Postgres. Maybe it should. Or maybe we need something else. 
Let's add another service. <laughs> let's, uh, let's add a service that, that checks the task API like the front end would. I mean, not, not from the front end, but in the back end that interacts with the task API and looks for tasks that it knows that it wants to sync in a certain way to, the, to a different service. So kind of like an integration service. You could do that. And then what you would do is you would have, I guess this integration service would, hmm, that's too big of a name, probably. Maybe like task result <laughs> sync service is the name that limits the scope of what we're trying to solve. Uh, if I were to do that, then I could have it ask the task API uh, for completed tasks. And then what's in that? Oh, right, I don't have, I don't have a backend. I don't have like a Redis client, I have nothing. Uh, let's look at the code. The, the code can tell us. Um, but uh, yeah, I think <laughs> what's interesting here is maybe the result is not necessarily always called a CRUD API to like save a record or update a record. It could also be to call a different API, even the task API again, right? Oh, this task completes trigger another task to do the next thing, right? So we can break up tasks into smaller pieces. Um, yeah. So what is the, uh, the record that we're storing in Redis for tasks look like? Where is that defined? Okay, so currently a task the key is actually not necessarily stored in the record, um, but the ID, the URL, the payload, the data key, the title, the status, and the last updated. So the data key tells the uh, task worker when it gets a response from the service that it's calling to do the task, where in the, pay in the response is the data element that it needs to pull out and save. Um, and then title is just like a UI element. Hey Jake, how's it going? Good morning or afternoon, as it may be for you. You have to tell me how my, uh, my microphone is today because I'm just using the microphone on my laptop. Uh, <laughs> I'm using the everything on my laptop uh, today because I'm streaming from a hotel, as it says in the, the stream title. But anyway, how are you doing? to notice when chat messages come in. <laughs> so the key thing if I had it this other service that I guess I would need some kind of like That work. How does this work again? <laughs> uh, at least to me, audio sounds fine. All right. Well, that that's interesting. <laughs> well, I guess. Uh... Hey, Alex. Been a little bit since I've seen you here. 
How are you doing? Yeah, you got an ad. Can't hear me. <laughs> All right. Well. <laughs> Let me know <laughs> when you are back. Winky face. Ah, wow, brainless. <laughs> brainless Society gifted a tier one subscription to Alex Games underscore TTV. Thanks for the gifted sub, brainless. Now, Alex, uh, I guess technically if you're still watching an ad, you're not going to hear me. <laughs> You'd have to refresh, I think, to escape the ad. I know I had to do that the other day. I was really annoyed. I was watching someone. It's ended. Well, welcome back. And now you won't get ads, at least for a month. So today, uh, it's kind of a weird stream, kind of a scuffed stream. <laughs> uh, because I'm streaming from this hotel room uh, getting ready to go on a trip for the week and um, yeah so <laughs> uh, I will try to see I, I don't know if I'll be able to stream anything tomorrow because I think I may be yeah might not be able to do that but the other days I will try to stream at least something for a little bit. Maybe maybe if it's just like a just chatting thing, doing uh, Duolingo or something from my phone. Um, but otherwise I'm gonna be doing like work related stuff um, and transit and travel this week. But in the meantime, I figured I could, I could do a little bit of coding. I could try to get um, OBS working uh, on this laptop and, and do some, some work on Glowing Telegram. Um, I did the other day finally get some new coding videos up on YouTube as well. And those were produced with Glowing Telegram. They even got a few likes. Uh, what's happening? How's everything? What have I missed <laughs> since I've been away? Uh, boy, how long has it been? Uh, a few Fridays ago, I started playing RimWorld on Friday when the Anomaly DLC came out. Um, Sunday morning streams have just been working on this project, Glowing Telegram, um, <laughs> for quite a while now. Um, Still playing GT and H on Mondays. Uh, was saying earlier that unfortunately I could not get it working on this laptop. It's, it seems to have like some some like texture loading issues or something. I have not figured out. Uh, and yeah, pretty much same old, same old, you know. Uh, what was I doing? <laughs> uh, so I think I was trying to figure out how it would work if we had a service, right? So the the problem, the problem is we have a way to like kick off an asynchronous background job. So AKA, I want to upload a video to YouTube. I click a button. I don't want to sit there and have to keep the browser window open. I don't want it to fail if I close the browser or I go off and I do something else. I want it to just happen in the background on the server. Um, and I want to be able to see when it's done, but, and, and that works today, but what I need to have happen is that when that's done, I want the result to be synced back over to the, the episode record in the database, right? So we have table is it this file that I want to look at yeah so we have an episodes table 
it has all these things like the title and the description and when it's created, what stream it was from, uh, what like cuts we did. BRB, all right. What series the episode is a part of. So that's um, newer, right? Being able to track like here is the series. So like glowing telegram is a series. Um, and, and kind of what has led me to talk about this right now is what I would really like to be able to do is when I upload the video to YouTube, um, I want Glowing Telegram to look at the series that that episode is related to. Um, and on the series table, I would have like a playlist ID that would be the playlist on YouTube. And if I have that, take the new video and put it in the playlist. Seems straightforward, right? But um, we can't add it to the playlist until the video is uploaded. We need the video ID, like the ID of the video that we get when we create, like when we upload it. But that doesn't happen until like the asynchronous, AKA background task does its thing. Uh, but I don't have a way right now for other things in the backend to know about tasks being completed. So, oh, right, 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 okay. So I've, <laughs> uh, I remembered, right? So right now, how services know about tasks, right? Is there, there are two endpoints. There's a endpoint to list the tasks, just this slash tasks here. We can get a list of all the tasks that are out there, or we can create a new task by posting to that endpoint, or we can, you know, get update or delete a task as well. Although I think maybe delete handler and update handler are not actually implemented right now, if I remember right. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do nothing. Um, so one possibility would be to make something that pulls, that is it called the list tasks endpoint and asked about tasks, checked on them and then did stuff based on when tasks were done. That is pretty inefficient. We just have to have a service that called this service over and over and over again. And then it would need to keep track of tasks that it's seen before. Right, because we're not we're not exposing in this interface something to um, to say to to keep track of change in status. Right, you can ask that the this API for what the status is, but not what the status was <laughs> immediately before, or you know what's changed recently, or that kind of, kind of thing. And you could add an endpoint to this to do exactly that, right? We could add an endpoint to say, uh, since this point in time, what's changed? But then this service would need to keep track of that somehow. Um, now we could leverage the fact that all the task information is being stored in Redis to maybe, uh, do something there. Let's think about that. So the task worker is is probably where we would need to make changes to to be able to know about changes in, in task status. Right. So currently, what we're doing. Uh, Alex says, the thing is, I want to say weird stuff and mess around here. You just seem like an understanding person that doesn't need any of that, and I respect that. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, you can say weird stuff. Um, <laughs> I may react to that, or I may not. I, I mean, I guess really in all of my streams, I'm, I'm a, I'm a task oriented person, right? So like I have stuff I want to do. <laughs> e 
Even if that's just like figuring out, you are my definition of normal. Aww. Um, like, <laughs> yeah, task oriented, but literally breaking a code, looking looking at codes about tasks, update task status. <laughs> Uh, okay, go to definition. Oh, it doesn't know it. Oh, it's in load, probably. Okay, so how does this work? Hello there. Hello there. Yeah, at least I think all the overlay stuff should work, although I don't have OBS open right now. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um. This is gonna be background noise. I don't know if you're gonna hear that. We are uh, downtown in Seattle today. Just today. Okay, so. Update task status. Wait, does sound alert work for phone people? I kinda of don't know because I'm main PC. Um, well, what I have, I'm, 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 the, 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 the. <laughs> what am I trying to say? I'm using OBS on my laptop. Uh, you know, it's just Windows 10 PC. Um, and I have, what I did was on my OBS on my desktop computer, I exported all of my scenes and then I copied it over to this computer. So like I have all the same setup for OBS the biggest issue was that because the screen resolution is different um, and because I didn't set up some of the settings for screen resolution and like how that translates into what gets broadcast, um, then I had to go and move a bunch of stuff around. But like all of that stuff still works because in OBS, I have a source that's like a browser source that pulls in the uh, stream alerts, the sound alert stuff. It would be different if I, yeah, if I was streaming from my phone, like I may be doing later this week, then that stuff is not gonna work, except for, um, yeah, most of that stuff won't work because a lot of that stuff is like client side. Like it gets, it gets overlaid onto the video I'm broadcasting in OBS. Okay, so what we're doing right now is we're doing an H set twice. So the the task is represented in Redis as a well as a key because everything is keys and values. But inside of that, you know, looking up the record for that key is a hash. What is that emote? Nice. So many different heart emotes on Twitch. <laughs> um, so there's a hash. So like inside of the key, you look up the value. The value is a set of keys and values. That's basically what a hash uh, in this context means. Um, and so inside of the hash, we're setting the status to be whatever we're passing in for to update the status. And we're, we're updating last updated to be now, if I wanted to know about when tasks, when tasks complete, for me, I'm in love with sound alerts and emotes. Yeah, no, they're, they're nice. They, they're, they're definitely a fun thing <laughs> uh, for the stream. If I want to be able to have something trigger when this task completes, 
I don't think I can have, I don't think there's a way in Redis to be like, hey, tell me when these keys, you know, some something in the hash changes. I don't think that's a thing we can necessarily do. Um, cheat sheet. What's on the cheat sheet? So stuff with hashes. So we have h set. So what we're using. H get, h get all, h m get. Turns the values associated with specified fields so you can get multiple. Um, streams. So l push and r push. So uh, I'm using something, some of these things right now for the task queue, right? So when a task comes in, it gets put on the key, the key where the task record is gets put on the queue. <laughs> so, because I gotta say this, but you gotta put 1 million uh, chat points for you to twerk on cam. <laughs> no. It's just no. There's n there's no <laughs> there's no amount of points. This is this is a <laughs> this, this is a uh, a navigation issue. This is all the stuff about lists and the streams is down here. Wait, no, it's the same thing. Interesting. Uh, okay, so how are we? So in main.rs, I think we're looking at the task uh, queue. Yeah, we pop task from the queue. <laughs> um, so it's it's the worker runs forever. Loop forever, right? There's no condition here, it's just loop. Um, and we say, give us the next task from the queue, right? So the queue is just a list, essentially. And we're taking off of one end, and then the task API is putting stuff on the other end. So this is a, uh, um, a first in, first out queue, FIFO. Um, and basically we get that task, and then we, then we work it. And then what we actually do, so this is like, um, this worker only processes one task at a time. So if we need to process multiple tasks simultaneously, which you would want to do, you run multiple workers. Um, and then once the task is complete, we update the task status to complete and we remove the task from the temp queue. So, one idea would be to make another kind of worker or something else that ties into Redis, right? And this service and that service would integrate by, maybe we'd have another queue of like, here's stuff that's now complete. And that other worker could process those messages. 
<laughs> uh, oh, Mind Over Magic? Are you talking about Mind Over Magic? <laughs> I believe I recall that comment about the resemblance of the, the magical school that we had created. Uh, <laughs> was, that, was that like two months ago? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's, that's the one. Um, well, uh, we actually were talking about that earlier. Basically, all the Friday streams are based on viewer suggestion, right? So, yeah, that. Um, so, a few, like, I guess four weeks, <laughs> however many weeks it was, uh, RimWorld was suggested, and that, that won the poll. And we've just been running that because there haven't been suggestions of other games. But I think that um, maybe Brainless and others are going to suggest Mind Over Magic again. It came up earlier in the stream. But yeah, just uh, you just gotta drop, say, hey, what about for Friday? Let's, uh, what if you played this? And then uh, we'll just do a poll. And now that's not gonna be this Friday. Um, We'll see what's going to happen this Friday. <laughs> Maybe nothing, uh, but then definitely the Friday after. We'll go back to kind of the normal thing. Um, so yeah. So we can return to that. And I guess the question will be, do we, do we return to the the previous save and like continue there or do we start fresh i'm not sure there's any point in starting fresh um so yeah i don't know i don't know that i have really have a preference but yeah the game was mind over magic um all of the all of the vod pieces for that are on YouTube now. Do I have a command? You redeem points, hydrate. Okay, <laughs> give me one second, I will do that. Uh, is there a YouTube command? There should be. Why is it there? <laughs> Why isn't there not a YouTube command? All right. Ooh. I really should have. I'll be right back. No, no BRB screen, just stepping away. What's up with that? Yeah, it doesn't exist. Uh, well, it's either that or the bot is broken. Discord. Okay, yeah, the bot's broken. Oh no. Uh, One second. I got the bottle of water. I only spilled a little. <laughs> now this is definitely not going to show anything on stream that's sensitive. I'm sure. Yeah. No, I think. Um, this is something I want to do is make my own bot because it seems like the Streamlabs one only wants to work if I go and poke it every once in a while. Cloudbot. Yeah, it's, it's not even turned on. It turns itself off is I think what it is. All right, cool. There you go. <laughs> it's 
because Streamlabs wants me to, to pay them money. Is, uh, I assume what it is. Okay. One second, we're gonna, we're gonna incept a little bit here. <laughs> which, which microphone am I using? Okay, I'm using the laptop one. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could, I could make a worker, and like put messages on a queue to say, "Hey, here are the completed jobs." Then that worker would need to look at those jobs to figure out if there's more work to be done. I guess, like, what I don't want to do is I don't want to have this worker have to look at the the task and figure out that it needs to do more work here I think hmm or maybe I do or maybe I do maybe I want to have something where maybe we can attach something to the task record that says like next like next thing to do and then when the task worker finishes working on the task, it does the next, like, it cues the next thing to do, right? Um, what would that look like, right? So if we go back to the task API where tasks are created, create handler. Okay, no, no control click today. <laughs> Uh, I probably just need to reload all of my extensions. Yeah. Okay, stand by. We're just going to reload. All right. I went and uh, grabbed one of the bottles of water from the other room. I'm working through that, Alex. So in task API, how do we create a task? We get the queue for reporting, hey, there's a new task to do. Hydrate again. Didn't I have that in a cooldown? Ah, all right. So we're getting the queue name. We are incrementing and getting the task counter. Yeah, five minute cooldown. Had it been five minutes? That was fast. Or wait. Oh yeah, I guess, yeah, it, it, it'd been a little bit. All right, anyway. Um, right, so generating just the number to keep track. Like every task we do, we just increment this counter so that we have a unique number for the task, and then we create record. And so we pass in like stuff from the request to the task API and to create task. Um, so I could extend this, right? To be like, okay, and when you're done with this, then do another task. Could you, <laughs> could you just chain that and definitely, like, could you like make a task that had like seven, like several different segments? Um, so we'd go and do a thing, and then it would then do the next thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing. Why not? I think what we'd want to do is have it. So in the in the worker, ba, 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 ba. lots of thinking today. <laughs> Uh, part of that is just because I don't even have like a working environment to run any of this stuff. <laughs> See, this is technically working. Is it though? Um, 
I don't have a like a dev environment here to run uh, all the backend stuff easily, so I'm just not gonna bother. <laughs> gonna figure out um, figure out some stuff here. Uh, so in in this is where I wanted to look. What's he thinking about? <laughs> I'm just claiming it is okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. So, when we do the work of the task, right? So, we. The task worker. The work is calling a different API. Right, so we, we have this URL and a payload and we call it and we get a response back. And then um, yeah. And then assuming it succeeds, we probably don't want to actually print the response. That's probably not what we want to do. But we get the we look inside of the response for a key called data key or for the key whose value matches the value in ta inside a task that data key. Uh, and then we serialize that. So we turn it into JSON. And then we stick it in this array. So we're, we're, hmm, is this duplicating? Is this duplicating something else I'm doing? No, this is the only place where we, it's not the only place, aha. Here and here, aha. So really this should be, Was it before? Something like that. Uh, right, I probably need to do like cargo install. Cargo build. Do I even have a current version of Rust? Uh, <laughs> see, I know how to have a good time without being sexual, lol. Uh, okay. Without, though? Oh, no, no, you didn't say without. You didn't say without, you said without. I don't know what that is, but okay. Yeah, and no, I don't, I don't even have Rust set up on this machine. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> maybe I should do that. Uh, let's see, rust up. Is it though? Is it, is it really? Let's go from rust, rustlang.org. Bullying? How am I bullying? <laughs> I'm just pointing out that, you know, never mind. <laughs> I'm not gonna dig myself into a hole. Ah, uh, yeah, just enter. All right, we're gonna we're gonna have rust soon. Be really rusty. Okay, so we're saving this data. Um, 
to the array located at task data key. And presumably when we're finished, that's where the data will be. So I wonder if we wanted to extend task worker here to pass the result onto another task. To do that, I think we would have to say that the payload would be the data located at task data key that we've accumulated over potentially multiple runs, right? So thinking about this specific use case that I'm trying to solve right now, it would just be an array with a single value because this is going to be, um, just saw like a crow walk by the window, kind of weird. Anyway, um, it would just be an array with a single object that would be the like the result of calling the YouTube upload, I think. Is that how that should work? Nah, no worries. I mean, <laughs> the more you talk, the more the attorney has on you. Right, right, right. It's just not a productive line of conversation, no. Um, <laughs> no, don't worry about it. I, I I could stand to be a little little less less task oriented. Just have a little bit more fun. Respect the grind. So where do I where do I want to do this? Ooh. Huh. So, here's what I'm thinking about. So you have a task, and the task is to upload the video to YouTube. The task successfully does that, but that task does not have the ability to save the information or to trigger the next step or whatever. That's on the task worker to queue up the next thing. If that succeeds, but then for some reason queuing up the task fails, then should that mean that the original task has failed? At some point that will mean that we'll have the ability to like retry And then we're gonna have potentially multiple videos uploaded to YouTube. I think, I think in a failure scenario, it's gonna be expected that things may not be completely consistent, and there might be cleanup to do manually, at least for now. And two, I think it's pretty unlikely that the process of queuing up the next next task itself is going to fail because that's just gonna be this just a few lines of code where we're going to write some more stuff into redis one of the hot stream <laughs> streams coming um when i lose <laughs> when i 
when, when uh, I'll let, I'll let you know. <laughs> hmm. Okay. So I think what I want to do here What does that say? Dolphin diving from the top deck? Okay. So let's say here, we're gonna do something where if, <laughs> if the task has a next task key, then create a new task with the data from the previous task. It's like Copilot has read my mind. <laughs> you can watch that. Um, except, of course, that I don't want a next task key. I want, what do I want? What do I need? Maybe just the next task. Okay, so let's see what Copilot is written for us. If let sum next task equals task that next task. So this is this is saying that presumably inside of the task struct, there is a next task that is a uh, an optional field. At this point, I watch anything as long as the streamer is entertaining. Are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that I am entertaining? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, and then ah, uh, okay. So here, though. This will be this will be interesting. This is not going to quite work as is because the task is not going to have an ID or the the. Um... Oh no no no! Okay, I see what it's doing. Right, it's getting it's getting the task data key for the previous task, and then it's getting the contents of that with L range, maybe. <laughs> Uh, and that's a Vecca string. Okay, sure. It didn't. It didn't need to do that that way. Uh, and then let mute payload equals next text payload clone. And then data. Yeah, I, I guess we could do something like that, where we sneak in. Oh, are we trying to parse? Yeah, I guess we can do that. Um, so we're we're taking the the data from the previous task. We're parsing it back from JSON into just a representation, and then sticking that into the payload, and then we create a task record for the next task. Except we shouldn't expect that there's an ID on next task or a key. We'll have to derive those. Data key, next task. Data. Okay. And then if the next task has a next task, we copy that in. And then task worker push task. Is that is that a thing? I don't think push task is a thing. That, it made that up. <laughs> uh, but it could be a thing. Con Q name. Do we have Q name? We have Q name. Okay, cool. Okay. So the the goal here is gonna be to actually make this real. Did uh Okay, rest is installed. Cool. 
So we have some issues. The first being the task, which is um, coming from pop task here. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's 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 assume that we're gonna implement a function called uh, push task. Oh, and generate task data key. Apparently, we we're not using. Okay, cool. Okay, so we need to define next task. Do we define task in uh, in here somewhere? Yes, here we go. Okay, so we're gonna create a new field called next task. It's gonna be an option of a uh, next task. So why does this need to be different? Well, we're not gonna have the key or the ID when this is defined. The idea is that the client that's creating this task will be able to say, oh, and then when you're done with that, make another task. And so we're just kind of deferring, materializing that as an actual task until um, we get there. I don't know why there's a box. That doesn't seem necessary. Data key, payload, but not key or ID. All right, so these are the, cri the critical bits. And then we also want title. Um, so the client can say, oh, when we get to the second task, in this chain of things, here's the title of it. Here's what to call it. Uh, and we do the URL and payload. To add a key. Okay, so that all looks good. So now we have like the task can have the next task, which can have the next task, which can which can have the next task, uh, so on and so forth. Mint tea sounds nice. I know a bit random, but just came to mind. Yeah, mint tea sounds good. Uh, I think that's gonna be lunchtime here soon for me. Hmm. So I think conceptually this makes sense, although these things don't exist. We'll have to create them. Hmm. So there should be a function. There we go. And then we just need the next ID. So we could do this. What we probably should do instead is create a function to do that. Is that the other thing that I wanted to import? Push task. Uh, and then let's create a um, get next task ID. There we go. Um, You know, I meant drink that Frank. I <laughs> I hadn't even read that message yet. Uh, Mike, think about getting that cause I hate normal tea, but only drink it cause I hate water more and coffee is not even an option to think about. Well, that that is an opinion.
coffee bad for? For what? Not for me. I'm looking at my empty Starbucks cup right now. Not today, thank you. You uh, cut things from your life that aren't good for you? That's probably a good thing. So, uh, right. So I want to. I want to essentially do this, right? <laughs> I want to. I want to increment uh, the ID. I want to do that in a way that is um, get next task ID, mute Redis connection, result U sixty four. Yeah, something like this would be good. Uh, You, uh, you grew up with coffee? Okay, and this, I think I, I want to also make this so that this returns a result. It's gonna be like a unit result, but that's gonna be better than having, I don't, I want to stop using expect because I want this to be like a library that I'm using other places. Your your last message. Okay. So this is still not right. I don't want to do dot expect. Copilot. Uh, so what is this type here? All right, we don't have Rust Analyzer working. Can we can we restart Rust Analyzer? Restart server. Self-discipline? You grew up with self-discipline? All right, it looks like Rust Analyzer might actually work now, now that I have Rust. That's kind of a kind of a prerequisite. Um, I just wanna know what LPush returns. Well, I think uh, we might wrap up soon. I see on the counter we've been at almost three hours, but there was a little bit more uh, <laughs> at the beginning where I was just trying to get the stream to work at all. Main language don't get <laughs> don't don't get together. <laughs> is uh, language can be hard oh yeah also this computer is really slow <laughs> so uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, let's do this I think I'm just gonna save where I'm at here this is all broken but it's fine it'll give me a good place to start from next time around um, inside of the work task worker, I am going to be using dot expect, so this will panic, because that's fine. The worker will crash and we'll start up another worker, right? Um, that's how the worker should behave, 
but the library code can also be used by the task API, and that shouldn't ever cause a panic. Yeah. And uh, this lack of sleep makes everything worse. Um, this reminds me of a, a CGP Grey video I saw a long time ago, but recently came across again, and it was like, uh, it was a video that was basically, here is all the things you need to do to be unhappy. With obviously the point being that these are the things you should avoid doing <laughs> if you want to be happy. Uh, and it's like, if you want to be unhappy, um, like, sleep and eat and work in a single room, uh, sleep in an inconsistent schedule, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but, yeah. Lack of sleep can cause a lot of problems. Inconsistent sleep. Okay. So I think conceptually, <laughs> this is this is what I want to do. Um, there's there's more work that we need to do in terms of actually then leveraging this to do things, and then telling the front end how to do this, updating the task API to support doing this. <laughs> Uh, I have a lack of, lack of uh, well, you say you don't want to talk about that one, so I, I won't, I won't verbalize it then. Um, but I guess, at the end of the day, if you know there's something that you want to be different, recognizing that as the first step. There may be a lot of other steps, but if you don't recognize that you want something different than what you have now, then uh, it's going to be hard to get. <laughs> it's it's going to be hard to get what you want if you don't even know what you want. Uh, which sounds kind of trite when I say it like that, but doesn't mean it's not true. All right, and with with that wonderful wonderful pearl of wisdom, I think we're going to wrap up the stream here. Uh, I'm gonna throw a commit down. I like how I started the plan. <laughs> oh boy, it's so slow. <laughs> so slow. Uh, yeah. That's fine. We'll get to that. We'll get there. I'm not sure what you mean, Alex. Alright, Copilot. Describe this change. <laughs> I see. Okay. Have you tried asking ChatGPT? <laughs> that's that's the answer, right? These days. the chat GPT I don't know <laughs> just this thing you know chat GPT oh good at least this time it's not it's a location I don't care about <laughs> can I turn this off So at least now I have some some things that I can include here in this message, this description. 
I'm really looking forward to the next coding stream where I'll be back at my desktop computer and things will not be so awfully slow. Uh, now here's a question. Has OBS been recording locally? The, uh, what did the bot say? Now a verse from a collective tale and Saban's dev stream, a wild chat roams free. Alex Game CTV dreams of hot tubs and tea. Uh, stuff about Pokemon. Typos and laughs, a dance with words in sight. Self-discipline jokes through the night. Relationship woes with sleep and brew, but in Saban's glow, we're all connected true. It's ChatGPT. <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming they're using like GPT-3 or something, scraping data from like the uh, chat messages and the stream descriptions and stuff like that. I could do that too. If I ever got my bot working and then tied it into the uh, OpenAI APIs. Uh, okay, so the idea for this pull request is going to be to um, allow for, all right, um, multiple chained, multiple chained tasks. So, task worker use next task. It's all about the tasks. So, the task worker queues next task. Um, task API supports next task. YouTube upload API returns video ID. Um, add video to the playlist is it's kind of the, the meta thing that I'm trying to do, right? Is is we're trying to make it so that when you upload the video through the tool, it also adds the video to the playlist, and this is all the stuff we need to do to do that. Um, then add new API to add video to playlist. Think your tiredness is finally hitting? Okay. Well, I hope you can find some uh, some rest when I finish typing out the things to do for next time. Add new API to add video to playlist. Add a playlist ID to um, what am I calling it? Series table. Uh, so that gives the ID. And then add playlist add task when triggering the upload
someone has a mega bomb. <laughs> Out there. Now oh, they're driving away. Good. I've been great company. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay. Well, uh, I think I'm gonna go see about getting some lunch. Maybe we can do a raid. 